Chapter One of Love Affairs of the Courts of Europe. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Cassie Christian. Love Affairs of the Courts of Europe by Thornton Hall. Chapter One A Comedy Queen. It was to a noise like thunder and close clasped in a soldier's embrace that Catherine the First made her first appearance in Russian history. History, indeed, contains few chapters more strange, more seemingly impossible, than this which tells the story of the maid of all work, the red-armed, illiterate peasant girl who, without any dower or beauty or charm, won the idolatry of an emperor and succeeded him on the greatest throne of Europe so obscure was catherine's origin that no records reveal either her true name or the year or place of her birth all that we know is that she was cradled in some livonian village either in sweden or poland around the year sixteen eighty five the reputed daughter of a serf mother and a peasant farmer and that her numerous brothers and sisters were known in later years by the name skovoroshtenko or skovronsky the very christian name by which she is known to history was not hers until it was given to her by her imperial lover it is not until the year seventeen o two when the future empress of the russias was a girl of seventeen that she makes her first dramatic appearance on the stage on which she was to play so remarkable a part then we find her acting as maidservant to the lutheran pastor of marienburg scrubbing his floors nursing his children and waiting on his resident pupils in the midst of all perils of warfare the russian hosts had for weeks been laying siege to marienburg and the commandant unable to defend the town any longer against such overwhelming odds had announced his intention to blow up the fortress and had warned the inhabitants to leave the town between the alternatives of death within the walls and the enemy without pastor gluck chose the latter and sallying forth with his family and maidservant threw himself on the mercy of the russians who promptly packed him off to moscow a prisoner for martha as she seems to have been known in those days a different fate was reserved her red lips saucy eyes and opulent figure were too seductive a spoil to part with general sheremetief decided and she was left behind a by no means reluctant hostage peter's soldiers now that victory was assured were holding high revel of feasting and song and dancing they received the new prisoner literally with open arms and almost before she had wiped the tears from her eyes at parting from her nurslings she was capering gaily to the music of hautboy and fiddle with the arm of a stalwart soldier round her waist suddenly says wasilewski a fearful explosion overthrew the dancers cut the music short and left the servant-maid fainting with terror in the arms of a dragoon thus did martha the siren of the kitchen dance her way into russian history little dreaming we may be sure to what dizzy heights her nimble feet were to carry her for a time she found her pleasure in the attentions of a non-commissioned officer sharing the life of camp and barracks and making friends by the good nature which bubbled in her and which was always her chief charm when her sergeant began to weary of her she found a humble place as laundry maid in the household of menshikov the tsar's favorite whose shirts we are told it was her privilege to wash and who it seems was by no means insensible to the buxom charms of this maid of the laundry at any rate we find menshikov when he was spending the easter of seventeen o six at witsipik writing to his sister to send her to him but a greater than menshikov was soon to appear on the scene none other than the emperor peter himself one day the tsar calling on his favorite was astonished to see the cleanliness of his surroundings and his person how do you contrive he asked to have your house so well kept and to wear such fresh and dainty linen menshikov's answer was to open a door through which the sovereign perceived a handsome girl aproned and sponge in hand bustling from chair to chair and going from window to window scrubbing the window panes a vision of industry which made such a powerful appeal to his majesty that he begged an introduction on the spot to the lady of the sponge the most daring writer of fiction could scarcely devise a more romantic meeting than this between the autocrat of russia and the red-armed bustling cleaner of the window-panes and he would certainly never have ventured to build on it the romance of which it was the prelude what it was in the young peasant woman that attracted the emperor is impossible to say of beauty she seems to have none save perhaps such as lies in youth and rude health we look at her portraits in vain to discover a trace of any charm that might appeal to a man her pictures in the Romanov gallery at St. Petersburg show a singularly plain woman with a large, round peasant face, 
the most conspicuous feature of which is a hideously turned-up nose large protruding eyes and an opulent bust complete a presentment of the typical household drudge a servant girl in a german inn but peter the great who was ever abnormal in all his tastes and appetites was always more ready to make love to a woman of the people than to the most beautiful and refined of his court ladies his standard of taste as of manners has not inaptly been likened to that of a dutch sailor but whatever it was in the low-born laundry woman that attracted the Tsar of russia we know that this first unconventional meeting led to many others and that before long catherine for we may now call her by the name she made so famous was removed from his favorite's household and installed in the imperial harem where for a time at least she seems to have shared her favors indiscriminately between her old master and her new an obscure and complacent mistress until menshikov finally resigned all rights in her to his sovereign when catherine took up her residence in her new home while lazuski tells us her eye shortly fell on certain magnificent jewels forthwith bursting into tears she addressed her new protector who put these ornaments here if they come from the other one i will keep nothing but this little ring but if they come from you how could you think that i needed them to make me love you if catherine lacked physical graces this and many another story prove that she had a rare gift of diplomacy she had moreover an unfailing cheerfulness and goodness of heart which quickly endeared her to the moody and capricious peter in his frequent fits of nervous irritability which verged on madness she alone had the power to soothe him and restore him to sanity her very voice had a magic to arrest him in his worst rages and when the fit of madness for such it undoubtedly was was passing away she would take his head and caress it tenderly passing her fingers through his hair soon he grew drowsy and slept leaning against her breast for two or three hours she would sit motionless waiting for the cure slumber always brought him until at last he awoke cheerful and refreshed thus each day the livonian peasant woman took deeper root in the heart of the emperor until she became indispensable to him wherever he went she was his constant companion in camp or on visits to foreign courts where she was received with the honors due to a queen and not only were her presence and her ministrations infinitely pleasant to him her prudent counsel saved him from many a blunder and mad excess and on at least one occasion rescued his army from destruction so strong was the hold she soon won on his affection and gratitude he is said to have married her secretly within three years of first setting eyes on her her future and that of the children she had borne to him became his chief concern and as early as seventeen o eight when he was leaving moscow to join his army he left behind him a note if by god's will anything should happen to me let the three thousand roubles which will be found in menshikov's house be given to katherine vasilevska and her daughter but whatever the truth may be about the alleged secret marriage we know that early in seventeen twelve peter in his admiral's uniform stood at the altar with the livonian maidservant in the presence of his court officials and with two of her own little daughters as bridesmaids the wedding we are told was performed in a little chapel belonging to prince menshikov and was preceded by an interview with the dowager empress and his princess sisters in which peter declared his intention to make catherine his wife and commanded them to pay her the respect due to her new rank then followed in brilliant sequence state dinners receptions and balls at all of which the laundress bride sat at her husband's right hand and received the homage of his subjects as his queen picture now the woman who but a few years earlier had scrubbed pastor glut's floors and cleaned menshikov's window panes in all her new splendors as empress of russia the portraits of her and her unaccustomed glories are far from flattering and by no means consistent she showed no sign of ever having possessed beauty said baron von Porsnitz. she was tall and strong and very dark and would have seemed darker but for the rouge and whitening with which she plastered her face the picture drawn by the margravine of Bareuth is still less attractive she was short and huddled up much tanned and utterly devoid of dignity or grace muffled up in her clothes she looked like a german comedy actress her old-fashioned gown heavily embroidered with silver and covered with dirt had been bought in some old clothes shop the front of her skirt was adorned with jewels and she had a dozen orders and as many portraits of saints fastened all along the facings of her dress so that when she walked she jingled like a mule but in the eyes of one man at least and he the greatest in all russia she was beautiful his allegiance never wavered nor indeed did that of his army which idolized her to a man she might have no boudoir graces but at least she was the typical soldier's wife 
and cut a brave figure as she reviewed the troops or rode at their head in her uniform and grenadier cap she shared all the hardships and dangers of campaigns with a smile on her lips sleeping on the hard ground and standing in the trenches with the bullets whistling about her ears and men dropping to the right and left of her nor was there ever a trace of vanity in her she was as proud of her humble origin as if she had been cradled in a palace to princes and ambassadors she would talk freely of the days when she was a household drudge and loved to remind her husband of the time when his empress used to wash shirts for his favorite though no doubt you have other laundresses about you she wrote to him once the old one never forgets you the letters that passed between this oddly assorted couple if couched in terms which could scarcely see print in our more restrained age are eloquent of affection and devotion to peter his kitchen queen was friend of my heart dearest heart and dear little mother he complains pathetically when away with his army i am dull without you and there is nobody to take care of my shirts when catherine once left him on a round of visits he grew so impatient at her absence that he sent a yacht to bring her back and with it a note when i go into my rooms and find them deserted i feel as if i must rush away at once it is all so empty without thee and each letter is accompanied by a present now a watch now some costly lace and again a lock of his hair or a simple bunch of dried flowers while she returns such homely gift as a little fruit or a fur-lined waistcoat on both sides too a vein of jocularity runs through the letters as when catherine addresses him as your excellency the very illustrious and eminent prince general and knight of the crowned compass and axe and when peter after the peace of neustadt writes according to the treaty i am obliged to return all livonian prisoners to the king of sweden what is to become of thee i don't know to which she answers with true wifely if affected humility i am your servant do with me as you will yet i venture to think you won't send me back quite idyllic this post-nuptial love-making between the great emperor and his low-born queen who has so possessed his heart that no other woman however fair could wrest it from her and in her exalted position of empress she practised the same diplomatic arts by which she had won peter's devotion politics she left severely alone she turned a forbidding back on all attempts to involve her in state intrigues but she was ever ready to protect those who appealed to her for help and to use her influence with her husband to procure pardon or lighter punishment for those who had fallen under his displeasure nor did she forget her poor relations in livonia one brother a postilion she openly acknowledged introduced to her husband and obtained a liberal pension for him and to her other brothers and sisters she sent frequent presents and sums of money more she could not well do during her husband's lifetime but when she in turn came to the throne she brought the whole family postilion shoemaker farm laborer and serf their wives and families to her capital installed them in sumptuous apartments in her palaces decked them in the finest court feathers and gave them large fortunes and titles of nobility when the tsar's quarrel with his eldest son came to its tragic denouement in alexis's death her own son became heir presumptive to the throne of russia and thus the chain that bound peter to his empress received its completing link it only remained now to place the crown formally on the head of the mother of the new heir and this supreme honor was hers in the month of may seventeen twenty nine wonderful tales are told of the splendors of catherine's coronation no existing crown was good enough for the ex maid of all work so one of special magnificence was made by the court jewellers a miracle of diamonds and pearls crowned by a monster ruby at a cost of a million and a half roubles the coronation gown which cost four thousand roubles was made at paris from paris too came the gorgeous coach with its blaze of gold and heraldry in which the tsarina made her triumphal progress through the streets of the capital from the winter palace the culminating point of this remarkable ceremony came when after peter had placed the crown on his wife's head she sank weeping at his feet and embraced his knees catherine however had not worn her crown many months when she found herself in considerable danger of losing not only her dignities but even her liberty for some time it is said she had been engaged in a liaison with william mons a handsome gay young courtier brother to a former mistress of the czar the love affair had been common knowledge at the court to all but peter himself and it was accident that at last opened his eyes to his wife's dishonor one moonlit night so the story is told he chanced to enter an arbor in the palace gardens and there discovered her in the arms of her lover his vengeance was swift and terrible mons was arrested the same night in his rooms and dragged fainting into the tsar's presence where he confessed his disloyalty 
a few days later he was beheaded at the very moment when the empress was dancing a minuet with her ladies a smile on her lips whatever grief was in her heart the following day she was driven by her husband past the scaffold where her lover's dead body was exposed to public view so close in fact that her dress brushed against it but without turning her head she kept up a smiling conversation with the perpetrator of this outrage on her feelings still not content with his revenge peter next placed the dead man's head enclosed in a bottle of spirits of wine in a prominent place in the empress's apartment and when she still smilingly ignored its horrible proximity his anger hitherto repressed blazed forth fiercely with a blow of his strong fist he shattered a priceless venetian vase shouting thus i will treat thee and thine to which she calmly responded you have broken one of the chief ornaments of your palace do you think you have increased its charm for a time peter refused to be propitiated he would not speak to his wife or share her meals or her room but she had tamed the tiger many a time before and she was able to do it again within two months she had worn her way back into full favor and was once more the tsar's dearest katerinushka a month later peter was dead carrying his love for his peasant empress to the grave and catherine was reigning in his stead able at last to conduct her amours openly spending her nights in shameless orgies with her lovers and leaving the rascally menshikov to do the ruling until death brought her amazing career to an end within sixteen months of mounting her throne end of chapter one recording by kathy christian chapter number two of love affairs of the courts of europe this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Cassie Christian. Love Affairs of the Courts of Europe by Thornton Hall. Chapter 2. The Bonnie Prince's Bride. In the pageant of our history, there are few more attractive figures than that of Bonnie Prince Charlie, the yellow-haired laddie whose blue eyes made a slave of every woman who came under their magic, and whose genial, unaffected manners turned the veriest coward into a hero, ready to follow him to the death in that year of ill-fated romance, the Forty-Five. The very name of the Bonnie Prince, the hope of the fallen Stuarts, the idol of Scotland, leading a forlorn hope with laughter on his lips, now riding proudly at the head of his rabble army now a fugitive ishmael among the hills and caves of the highlands but ever the last to lose heart has a magic still to quicken the pulses that later years proved the idol's feet to be of clay that he fell from his pedestal to end his days an object of contempt and derision only served to those who knew him in the pride of his youth to mingle pity with the glamour of romance that still surrounds his name in the year 1772, when this story opens, Charles Edward, Count of Albany, had already travelled far on the downward road that led from the glory of Prestonpans to his drunkard's grave. A pitiful pensioner of France, who had known the ignominy of wearing fetters in a French prison, a social outcast whose royal pretensions were at best the subject of an amused tolerance, the laddie of the yellow hair had fallen so low that the brandy bottle which was his constant companion night and day was his only solace picture him at this period and mark the pathetic change which less than thirty years had wrought in the stuart darling of the forty-five when many a proud lady of scotland would have given her life for a smile from his bonny face a middle-aged man with dropsy in his limbs and with the bloated face of the drunkard dull thick silent-looking lips of purplish red scarce redder than the skin pale blue eyes tending to a watery grayness leaden vague sad but with angry streakings of red something inexpressibly sad gloomy helpless vacant and debased in the whole face such was this young chevalier when france took it into her head to make a pawn of him in the political chess game with england as a man he was beneath contempt as a king well he was a roi pour rire but at least the royal house he represented might be made a useful weapon against the arrogant hanoverian who sat on his father's throne that rival stock must not be allowed to die out his claims might weigh heavily some day in the scale between france and england charles edward must marry and provide a worthier successor to his empty honours 
and thus it was that france came to the exiled prince with the seductive offer of a petty bride and a pension of forty thousand crowns a year the besotted charles jumped at the offer left his brandy bottle and with the alacrity of a youthful lover rushed away to woo and win the bride who had been chosen for him and never surely there was such a grotesque wooing charles was a physical wreck of fifty-two his bride-elect had only seen nineteen summers the daughter of prince gustav adolf of stolberg and the countess of horn princess louise was kin to many of the greatest houses in europe from the colonnas to andorsinis to the hohenzerns and bruces in blood she was thus at least a match for her Stuart bridegroom she had spent some years in the seclusion of a monastery and had emerged for her undesired trip to the altar a young woman of rare beauty and charm with glorious brown eyes the delicate tint of the wild rose in her dimpled cheeks a wealth of golden hair and a figure every line and movement of which was instinct with beauty and grace she was a fresh unspoilt child bubbling with gaiety and the joy of life and her dainty little head was full of the romance of sweet nineteen such then was the singularly contrasted couple beauty and the beast they were dubbed by many who stood together at the altar at macerata on good friday of the year seventeen seventy two the bridegroom looking hideous in his wedding suit of crimson silk in flaming contrast to the virginal white of his pretty victim it needed no such day of ill omen as a friday to inaugurate a union which could not have been otherwise than disastrous the union of a beautiful romantic girl eager to exploit the world of freedom and of pleasure and a drink-sodden man old enough to be her father for whom life had long lost all its illusions it is true that for a time charles edward was drawn from his bottle by the lure of a pretty and winsome wife who should if any power on earth could have made a man again of him she laughed indeed at his maudlin tales of past heroism and adventure in love and battle to her he was a plaster hero and she let him know it she was mated to a clown and a drunken clown to boot and well she would make the best of a bad bargain if her husband was the sorriest lover who ever poured thick-voiced flatteries into a girl-wife's ears there were others plenty of them who were eager to pay more acceptable homage to her and these men poets courtiers great men in art and letters flocked to her salon to bask in her beauty and be charmed by her wit after all she was a queen although she wore no crown she had a court although no royalties graced it from the pope to the king of france no monarch in europe would recognize her husband's kingship but at such neglect the offspring of jealousy of course she only smiled she could indeed have been moderately happy in her girlish light-hearted way if her husband had not been such an impossible person as for charles edward he soon wearied of a bride who did nothing but laugh at him and who was so ready to escape from his obnoxious presence to the company of more congenial admirers he returned to his brandy bottle and alternated between a fuddled brain and moods of wild jealousy he would not allow his wife to leave the door without his escort if she refused to accompany him he turned the key in her bedroom door to which the only access was through his own room he took her occasionally to the theatre or opera his brandy bottle always making a third for company before the performance was half through he was snoring stertorously on the couch which he had insisted on having in his box and more often than not was borne to his carriage for the journey home helplessly drunk and this within the first year of his wedded life if any woman had excuse for seeking elsewhere the love she could not find in her husband it was louise of albany there were dames in plenty in rome where they were living now who not content with devoted husbands had their suspeos to play the lover to them but louise sought no such questionable escape from her unhappiness her books and the clever men who thronged her salon were all the solace she asked and under temptations such as few women of that country and day would have resisted she carried the shield of a blameless life from rome the countess and her husband fared to florence in seventeen seventy four and here matters went from bad to worse charles was now seldom sober day or night and his jealousy often found expression in filthy abuse and cowardly assaults hitherto he had been simply disgusting now he was a constant menace even to her life she lived in hourly fear of his brutality but in her darkest hour sunshine came again into her life with the coming of vittorio alfieri whose name was to be linked with hers for so many years at this time alfieri was in the very prime of his splendid manhood 
one of the handsomest and most fascinating men in all Europe. Some four years older than herself, he was a tall, stalwart, soldierly man, blue-eyed and auburn-haired, an aristocrat to his fingertips, a daring horseman, a poet, and a man of rare culture, just the man to set any woman's heart aflutter, as he had already done in most of the capitals of the continent. He was a spoilt child of fortune, this Italian poet and soldier, a man who had drunk deep the cup of life, and to whom all conquest came with such fatal ease that already he had drained life dry of its pleasures. Such was the man who one autumn day in the year 1777 came into the unhappy life of the Countess of Albany, still full of the passions and yearnings of youth. It was surely fate that thus brought together those two young people of kindred tastes and kindred disillusions and we cannot wonder that of that first meeting alfieri should write at last i had met the one woman whom i had sought so long the woman who could inspire my ambition and my work recognizing this and prizing so rare a treasure i gave myself up wholly to her those were happy days for the countess that followed this fateful meeting days of sweet communion of twin souls hours of stolen bliss when they could dwell apart in a region of high and ennobling thoughts while the besotted husband was sleeping off the effects of his drunken orgies in the next room to alfieri louise was indeed the anchor of his life giving stability to his vacillating nature and inspiring all that was best and noblest in him while to her the association with this splendid creature who so thoroughly understood and sympathized with her was the revelation of a new world thus three happy years passed and then the crisis came one night the prince, in a mood of drunken madness, inflamed my jealousy, attacked his wife, and, after severely beating her, flung her down on her bed and attempted to strangle her. This was the crowning outrage of years of brutality. She could not, dared not, spend another day with such a madman. At any cost she must leave him, and forever. When morning came, with Alfieri's assistance, the plan of escape was arranged in the company of a lady friend and also of her husband now scared and penitent but fearing to let her out of his sight she drove to a neighboring convent ostensibly to inspect the nun's needlework on reaching her destination she ran up the convent steps entered the building and the door was slammed and bolted behind her in the very face of charles edward who had followed as fast as his dropsical legs would carry him up the steps the prince blazing at such an outrage hammered fiercely at the door until at last the lady abbess herself showed her face at the grating and told him in no ambiguous words that he would not be allowed to enter his wife had come to her for protection and if he had any grievance he had better appeal to the duke of tuscany thus ended the tragic union of the bonny prince and his countess emancipation had come at last and while louise was now free to devote her life to her beloved alfieri her brutal husband was left for eight years to the company of his bottle and the ministrations of his natural daughter until a drunkard's grave at frascati closed over his misspent life the pity and the tragedy of it louise of albany and her poet lover were now free to link their lives at the altar but no such thought seems to have entered the head of either they were perfectly happy without the bond of the wedding ring of which the countess had such terrible memories and together they walked through life happy in each other and indifferent to the world's opinion now in florence now in rome living together in alsace drifting to paris and when the revolution drove them from the french capital seeking refuge in london where we find the uncrowned queen of england treating amicably with the usurper george in the royal box at the opera always inseparable and louise always clinging to the shreds of her royal dignity with the throne in her anteroom and your majesty on her servant's lips thus passed the careless happy years for countess and poet until in eighteen o three alfieri followed the bonny prince behind the veil and left a desolate louise to moan amid her tears there is no more happiness for me but louise was not left even now without the solace of a man's love which seemed as indispensable to her nature as the air she breathed before alfieri had been many months in his florence tomb his place by the countess's side had been taken by francois xavier faber a good-looking painter of only moderate gifts whose handsome face plausible tongue and sunny disposition soon made a captive of her middle-aged heart at the time when faber came thus into her life madame la comtesse had passed her fiftieth birthday youth and beauty had taken wings and passion if ever she had any for her relations with alfieri seemed to have been quite platonic had died down to its embers 
but a man's companionship and the homage were always necessary to her and in favor she found her ideal cavalier her salon now became more popular than in the days of her young wifehood it drew to it all the greatest men in europe men of worldwide fame in statesmanship letters and art all anxious to do homage to a woman of such culture with such rare gifts of conversation that she was now middle-aged stout and dowdy like a cook with pretty hands as stendhal said of her mattered nothing to her admirers many of whom remembered her in the days of her lovely youth she was in their eyes as much a queen as if she wore a crown and moreover she was a woman of magnetic charm and clever brain and thus with her books and her salon and her cavalier she spent the rest of her checkered life until the end came one day in eighteen twenty four and her last resting place was as she wished it to be by the side of her beloved alfieri in the church of santa croce in florence midway between the tombs of michelangelo and machiavelli the two lovers sleep together their last sleep beneath a beautiful monument fashioned by canova's hands louise wife of the bonny prince as we still choose to remember him and vittorio alfieri to whom to quote his own words she was beyond all things beloved end of chapter two recording by cassie christian chapter three of love affairs of the courts of europe this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Cassie Christian. Love Affairs of the Courts of Europe by Thornton Hall. Chapter Three, The Peasant and the Empress. Many an autocrat of Russia has shown a truly sovereign contempt for convention and the choice of his or her favorites, the playthings of an hour, and at least three of them have carried this contempt to the altar itself. Peter the First, as we have seen offered a crown to Martha Skrivronsky, a Livonian scullery maid, who succeeded him on the throne. The second Catherine gave her hand as well as her heart to Petiomkin, the gigantic ill-favored ex-sergeant of cavalry, and Elizabeth, daughter of Peter and his kitchen queen, proved herself worthy of her parentage when she made Alexis Resume a peasant son, husband of the Empress of Russia. You will search history in vain for a story so strange and romantic as this of the great empress and the lowly shepherd's son, whom her love raised from a hovel to a palace, and on whom one of the most amorous and fickle of sovereign ladies lavished honors and riches and an unwavering devotion until her eyes, speaking their love to the last, were closed in death. It was in the humblest hovel of the village of Lemesh that Alexis Resume drew his first breath one day in 1709 his father gregory resume was a shepherd who spent his pitiful earnings in drink a man of violent temper who in his drunken rages was the terror not only of his home but of the entire village his wife and children cowered at his approach and on more than one occasion only accident or providence saved him from the crime of murder on one such occasion we are told the child alexis who from his earliest years had a passion for reading was absorbed in a book when his father in ungovernable fury seized a hatchet and hurled it at the boy's head luckily the missile missed its mark and alexis escaped to find refuge in the house of a friendly priest who not only gave him shelter and protection but taught him to write and above all to sing little dreaming that he was thus paving the way which was to lead the drunken shepherd's lad to the dizziest heights in russia for the boy had a beautiful voice when he joined the choir of his village church people flocked from far and near to listen to the sweet notes that soared pure and liquid as a nightingale's song above the rest it was all declared the voice of an angel and the face of an angel for alexis was as beautiful in those days as any child of picture or of dreams one day a splendidly dressed stranger chanced to enter the lemish church during mass none other than colonel vishnevsky a great court official who was on his way back to moscow from a diplomatic mission and he listened entranced to a voice sweeter than any he had ever heard the service over he made the acquaintance of the young forester interviewed his guardian the good samaritan priest and persuaded him to allow the boy to accompany him to the capital thus the shepherd's son took weeping farewell of the good priest of his mother and of his brothers and sisters and a few weeks later the empress and her ladies were listening enchanted to his voice in the imperial choir at moscow but none with more delight than the princess elizabeth 
daughter of peter the great to whom alexis's beauty appealed even more strongly than his sweet singing elizabeth true daughter of her father had already young as she was counted her lovers by the score lovers chosen indiscriminately from royal princes to grooms and common soldiers she was already sated with the license of the most dissolute court of europe and to her the young cossack of the beautiful face and voice and rustic innocence opened a new and seductive vista of pleasure she lost her heart to him had him transferred to her own court as her favorite singer and within a few years gave him charge of her purse and her properties the shepherd's son was not now only lover-elect but principal minister to the daughter of an emperor who was herself to wear the imperial crown and while alexis was thus luxuriating amid the splendor of a court he by no means forgot the humble relatives he had left behind in his native village his father was dead his mother was reduced for a time to such a depth of destitution that she had to beg her bread from door to door his sisters had found husbands for themselves in their own rank and the favorite of an imperial princess had for brothers-in-law a tailor a weaver and a shepherd when news came to alexis of his mother's destitution he had sent her a sum of money sufficient to install her in comfort as an innkeeper the first of many kindnesses which were to work a startling transformation in the fortunes of the Rosum family events now hurried quickly the empress anna had died and was succeeded on the throne by the infant ivan her grandnephew who had been emperor but a few months when in seventeen forty one a coup d'etat gave the crown to elizabeth mistress of the limish peasant alexis was now husband in all but name of the empress of all the russias honors and riches were showered on him he was general grand master of the hounds chief gentleman of the bedchamber and lord of large estates yielding regal revenues but all his grandeur was powerless to spoil the man who still remained the simple peasant who so many years earlier had left his low-born mother with streaming eyes his great ambition now was to share his good fortune with her she must exchange her village inn for the luxuries and splendors of a palace and thus it was that one day a splendid carriage with gay liveried postilions dashed up to the door of the limish inn and carried off the simple peasant woman her youngest son cyril and one of her daughters to the open-mouthed amazement of the villagers at the entrance to the capital she was received by a magnificently attired gentleman in whom she failed to recognize her son alexis until he showed her a birthmark on his body picture now the peasant woman sumptuously lodged in the moscow palace decked in all the finery of silks and laces and jewels receiving the respectful homage of the high court officials caressed and petted by an empress while her splendid son looked smiling on as proud of his cottage mother as if she were a princess of the blood royal that the innkeeper was not happy in her gilded cage that her thoughts often wandered longingly to her cronies and the simple life of the village is not to be wondered it was all very well for such a fine gentleman as her son alexis but for a poor simple-minded woman like herself well she was too old for such a transplanting and we can imagine her relief when on the removal of the court to st petersburg she was allowed to bring her visit to an end and to return to her inn with wonderful stories of all she had seen her son and daughter however elected to remain as for cyril a handsome youth almost young enough to be his brother's son he was quick to win his way into the favor of the empress before he had been many months at court he was made a count and a gentleman of the bedchamber he was given for bride a grand niece of elizabeth and at twenty-two he was viceroy of the ukraine virtual sovereign of a kingdom of his own with his peasant mother who declined to share his palace comfortably installed in a modest house near his gates cyril in fact was to his last day as unspoiled by his unaccustomed grandeur as his brother alexis each was ready at any moment to turn from the obsequious homage of nobles to hobnob with a peasant friend or relative how utterly devoid of false pride alexis was is proved by the following anecdote one day when in company with the empress he was paying a visit to count lohenbold he rushed from elizabeth's side to fling his arms round the neck of one of his host's footmen are you mad alexis exclaimed the empress in her astonishment what do you mean by such senseless behavior i am not mad at all answered the favorite he is an old friend of mine but although no man ever deposed the shepherd from the first place in elizabeth's favor it must not be imagined that he was her only lover the daughter of the hot-blooded peter and the lusty scullery wench had always as great a passion for men as the second catherine 
who had almost as many favorites in her boudoir as gowns in her wardrobes she had her lovers before she was emancipated from the schoolroom and not the least favored of them and as said was her own nephew peter the second whom she would no doubt have married if it had been possible she turned her back on one great alliance after another preferring her freedom to a wedding ring that brought no love with it and she found her pleasure alike among the gentlemen of the court and among her own servants in the long list of her favorites we find a general succeeded by a sergeant Boutourlin, the handsome courtier giving place to Leolin, the sailor, and Count Shuvalov retiring in favor of Voitschinsky, the coachman. Thus one liaison succeeded another from girlhood to middle age, indeed long after she had passed the altar. But through all these varying attachments her heart remained constant to her shepherd lover, to whom she was ever the devoted wife, and, when he was ill, the tenderest of nurses. To please him, she even accompanied him on a visit to his native village, smiling graciously on his humble friends of other days, and partaking of the hospitality of the poorest cottagers, while on all who had befriended him in the days of his obscurity she lavished her favors. Of one man who had been thus kind she made a general on the spot. The friendly priest was given a highly paid post at court. High rank in the army was given to many of his humble relatives and a husband was found for a favorite niece in Count Reimann, the Chancellor's son. As for Alexis himself, nothing was too good for him. Although he had probably never handled a gun in his life, she made him field marshal and head of her army, and at her request Charles the Seventh dubbed him Count of the Holy Roman Empire, a distinction which Gregory Orloff in later years prized more than all the honors Catherine II showered on him, while the estates of which she made him lord were a small kingdom in themselves alexis the shepherd's son was now beyond any question the most powerful man in russia if he would he might easily have taken the sceptre from the yielding hands of the empress and played the autocrat as patiomkin played it under similar circumstances in later years but alexis cared as little for power as for rank and wealth he smiled at his honors fancy he said with his hearty laugh a peasant's son a count and a man who ought to be tending sheep a field marshal when courtly genealogists spread before him an elaborate family tree proving that he sprang from the princely stock of bogdan with many a grand duke of lithuania among his lineal ancestors he laughed loud and long at them for their pains don't be so ridiculous he said you know as well as i that my parents were simple peasants honest enough but people of the soil and nothing else if i am count and field marshal and viceroy i owe it all to the good heart of your empress and mine whose humble servant i am take it away and let me hear no more of such foolery such to the last was the unspoiled childlike nature of the man who so soon was to be not merely the first favorite but husband of an empress probably alexis would have lived and died elizabeth's unlicensed lover had it not been for the cunning of the cleverest of her chancellors the Susive who saw in his mistress's infatuation for her peasant the means of making his own position more secure elizabeth was still a young and attractive woman who might pick and choose among some of the most eligible suitors in europe for a share of her throne for there were many who would gladly have played consort to the good-looking autocrat of russia such a husband especially if he were a strong man might seriously impair the chancellor's position might even dispense with him altogether on the other hand he was high in the favor of the shepherd's son who had such a contempt for power and who thus would be a puppet in his hands why not make him husband in name as well as in fact it was after all an easy task the chancellor thus set himself elizabeth was by no means unwilling to wear a wedding ring for the man who had loved her so loyally and so long and any difficulties she might raise were quickly disposed of by her father confessor who was Vesusov's tool thus it came to pass that one day elizabeth and alexis stood side by side before the village altar of perovo and the words were spoken which made the shepherd's son husband of the empress the secrecy with which the ceremony was performed was but a fiction all the world knew that alexis gregorovitch was emperor by right of wedlock and flocked to pay homage to him in his new and exalted character he now had sumptuous apartments next to those of his wife he sat at her right hand on all state occasions he was her shadow everywhere and during frequent attacks of gout the empress ministered to him night and day in his own room with the tender devotion of a mother to a child 
Two children were born to them, a son and a daughter, the latter of whom, after a life of strange romance and vicissitude, ended her days in a loathsome dungeon of the fortress of Saints Peter and Paul, the victim of Catherine the Second's vengeance, miserably drowned, so one story goes, by an inundation of her cell. On Elizabeth's death in the year 1762, her husband was glad to retire from the court in which he had for so long played so splendid a part. None but myself, he said, can know with what pleasure I leave a sphere to which I was not born and to which only my love for my dear mistress made me resigned i should have been happier far with her in some small cottage far removed from the gilded slavery of court life he was happy enough now leading the peaceful life of a country gentleman on one of his many estates catherine the second had mounted the throne of russia the empress who according to masson had but two passions which she carried to the grave her love of man which degenerated into libertinage and her love of glory which degenerated into vanity a woman with the brain of a man and the heart of a courtesan catherine's fickle affection had flitted from one lover to another until it now had settled on gregory orloff the handsomest man in her dominions whom she was more than half disposed to make her husband this was a scheme which commended itself strongly to her chancellor Vronsky. there was a most useful precedent to lend support to it the alliance of the empress elizabeth with a man of immeasurably lower rank than catherine's favorite but it was important that this precedent should be established beyond dispute thus it was that one day when count alexis was poring over his bible by his country fireside chancellor vronsov made his appearance with ingratiating words and promises her majesty he informed the count was willing to confer imperial rank on him in return for one small favor the possession of the documents which proved his marriage to her predecessor elizabeth on hearing the request the ex-shepherd rose and with words of quiet scorn refused both the request and the proffered honour am not i he said a count a field marshal a man of wealth all of which i owe to the kindness of my dear dead mistress are not such honours enough for the peasant son whom she raised from the mire to sit by her side that i should purchase another bauble by an act of treachery to her memory but wait one moment he continued and leaving the room he returned carrying a small bundle of papers which he proceeded to examine one by one then collecting them he placed the bundle in the heart of the fire to the horror of the onlooking chancellor and as the flames were reducing the precious documents to ashes he said go now and tell those who sent you that i never was more than the slave of my august benefactress the empress elizabeth who could never so far have forgotten her position as to marry a subject thus with a lie on his lips the last crowning evidence of loyalty to his beloved queen and wife alexis resume makes his exit from the stage on which he played so strangely romantic a part a few years later his days ended in peace at his st petersburg palace with the name he loved best elizabeth on his lips End of chapter three Recording by Cassie Christian. Chapter 4 of Love Affairs of the Courts of Europe. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Cassie Christian. Love Affairs of the Courts of Europe by Thornton Hall chapter four a crown that failed henri of navarre hero of romance and probably the greatest king who ever sat on the throne of france had a heart as weak in love as it was stout in war to his last day he was a veritable coward before the battery of bright eyes and before ravillac's dagger brought his career to a tragic end one may day in the year sixteen ten he had counted his mistresses to as many as the years he had lived but of them all fifty-seven of them for the most part lightly coming and lightly going only one ever really reached his heart and was within measurable distance of a seat on his throne the woman to whom he wrote in the heyday of his passion never has man loved as i love you if any sacrifice of mine could purchase your happiness how gladly i would make it even to the last drop of my life's blood gabrielle d'estre who thus enslaved the heart of the hero which carried him to a throne through a hundred fights and inconceivable hardships 
was cradled one day in the year 1573 in Touraine. From her mother, Francois Babou, she inherited both beauty and frailness, for the Babou women were famous alike for their loveliness and for a virtue as facile even as that of Marie Gourdon, the pretty plaything of Francois I, who left Francois's arms to find a husband in Philip Babou, and thus to transmit her charms and frailty to Gabrielle. Her father, Antoine, son of Jean d'Estre, a valiant soldier under five kings, was a man of pleasure, who drank and sang his way through life, preferring Cupid to Mars and the joie de vivre to the call of duty. It is perhaps little wonder that Antoine's wife, after bearing seven children to her husband, left him to find at least more loyalty in the Marquis de Tourelle Aligre, a lover twenty years younger than herself. Thus it was that, deserted by her mother and with a father too addicted to pleasure to spare a thought for his children, Gabrielle grew to beautiful girlhood under the care of an aunt, now living in the family chateau in Picardy, now in the great Paris mansion, the Hotel d'Estre, and with so little guidance from precept or example that, in later years, she and her six sisters and brothers were known as the Seven Dudley Sins. In Gabrielle, at least, there was little that was vicious. She was an irresponsible little creature, bubbling over with mischief and gaiety, eager to snatch every flower of pleasure that caught her eyes a dainty little fairy with big blue wonder eyes golden hair the sweetest rosebud of a mouth ready to smile or to pout as the mood of the moment suggested with soft round baby cheeks as delicately flushed as any rose such was gabrielle d'estre on the verge of young womanhood when roger de saint lary du de bellegarde the king's grand equerry and one of the handsomest young men in france first set eyes on her in the chateau of Covre, and as was inevitable lost his heart to her at first sight when he rode away two days later such excellent use had he made of his opportunities he left a very happy if desolate maiden behind for gabrielle had little power to resist fascinations which had made a conquest of many of the fairest ladies at court when bellegarde returned to mont where henri was still struggling for the crown which was so soon to be his he foolishly gave the king of navarre such a rapturous account of the young beauty of picardy and his conquest that henri already weary of the faded charms of guillaume du Duin, his mistress promptly left his soldiering and rode away to see the lady for himself and to find that bellegarde's raptures were more than justified gabrielle however flattered though she was by such an honour as a visit from the king of navarre was by no means disposed to smile on the wooing of an ugly man old enough to be my father and indeed henri with all the glamour of the hero to aid him was but a sorry rival for the handsome and courtly bellegarde now nearing his fortieth year with a grizzled beard and skin battered and lined by long years of hard campaigning the future king of france had little to appeal to the romantic eyes of a maid who counted less than half his years and the king in turn rode away from the Covre castle as hopelessly in love as bellegarde but with much less encouragement to return but the hero of ivre and a hundred other battles was no man to submit to defeat in any lists and within a few weeks gabrielle was summoned to mont where he told her in decisive words that he loved her and that no one bellegarde or any other should share her with him indeed she exclaimed with a defiant toss of the head i will be no man's slave I shall give my heart to whom I please, and certainly not to any man who demands it as a right. And within an hour she was riding home fast as her horse could gallop. Henri was thunderstruck at such defiance. He must follow her at once and bring her to reason, but in order to do so, he must risk his life by passing through the enemy's lines. Such an adventure, however, was after his own heart, and, disguising himself as a peasant, with a bundle of faggots on his shoulder, he made his way safely to Covrin where he presented himself a pitiable spectacle of rags and poverty to be greeted by his lady with shouts of derisive laughter oh dear she gasped between her paroxysms of mirth what a fright you look for goodness sake go and change your clothes but though the king obeyed humbly gabrielle shut herself in her room and declined point blank to see him again such devotion however expressed in such a fashion did not fail in its appeal to the romantic girl and when a little later Gabrielle visited the royalist army, then besieging Chatra. It was a much more pliant Gabrielle who listened to the king's wooing, and whose eyes brightened at his stories of bravery and danger. Henri might be old and ugly, but
but he had at least a charm of manner a frank simple manliness which made him the idol of his soldiers and in fact of every woman who once came under its spell and to this charm even gabrielle the rebel had at last to submit until Bellegarde was forgotten and her hero was all the world to her the days that followed this slow awaking were crowded with happiness for the two lovers when gabrielle was not by her king's side he was writing letters to her full of passionate tenderness my beautiful love my all my true heart such were the sweet terms he lavished on her i kiss you a million times you say that you love me a thousand times more than i love you you have lied and you shall maintain your falsehood with the arms which you have chosen i shall not see you for ten days it is enough to kill me and again they call me king of france and navarre that of your subject is much more delightful you have much more cause for fearing that i love you too much than too little that fault pleases you and also me since you love it see how i yield to your every wish such were the letters among the most beautiful ever penned by lover which the king addressed to his menon in those golden days when all the world was sunshine for him black as the sky was still with the clouds of war and she returned love for love tenderness for passion when he was lying ill at st denis she wrote i die of fear tell me i implore you how fares the bravest of the brave give me news my cavalier for you know how fatal to me is your least ill i cannot sleep without sending you a thousand good nights for i am the princess constancy sensible to all that concerns you and careless of all else in the world good or bad through the period of stress and struggle that still separated henri from the crown which for nearly twenty years was his goal gabrielle was ever by his side to soothe and comfort him to chase away the clouds of gloom which so often settled on him to inspire him with new courage and hope and with her diplomacy checking his impulses to smooth over every obstacle that the cunning of his enemies placed in his path and when at last one evening in fifteen ninety four henri made his triumphal entry into paris on a gray horse wearing a gold embroidered gray habit his face proud and smiling saluting with his plume-crowned hat the cheering crowds gabrielle had the place of honor in front of him in a gorgeous litter so bedecked with pearls and gems that she paled the light of the escorting torches this was indeed a proud hour for the lovers which saw henri acclaimed at long last king of france and his loyal lady love queen in all but name the years of struggle and hardship were over years in which henri of navarre had braved and escaped a hundred deaths and in which he had been reduced to such pitiable straits that he had often not known where his next meal was to come from or where to find a shirt to put on his back gabrielle was now marquis de monceau a title to which her royal lover later added that of duchesse de Ruffard. Her son César was known as Monsieur, the title that would have been his if he had been heir to the French throne. All that now remained to fill the cup of her ambition and her happiness was that she should become the legal wife of the king she loved so well, and of this the prospect seemed more than fair. Charming stories are told of the idyllic family life of the new king, how his greatest pleasure was to play at soldiers with his children, to join in their nursery romps, or to take them, like some bourgeois father, to the Saint Germain Fair and return loaded with toys and boxes of sweetmeats to spend delightful homely evenings with the woman he adored but it was not all sunshine for the lovers paris was in the throes of famine and plague and flood poverty and discontent stalked through her streets and there were scowling and envious eyes to greet the king and his lady when they rode laughing by or when as on one occasion we read of they returned from a hunting excursion riding side by side she sitting astride dressed all in green and holding the king's hand nor within the palace walls was it all a bed of roses for gabrielle for she had her enemies there and chief among them the powerful duc de sully her most formidable rival in the king's affection sully was not only henri's favorite minister he was the jonathan to his david the man who had shared a hundred dangers by his side and by his devotion and affection had found a firm lodging in his heart between the minister and the mistress each consumed with jealousy of the other henri had many a bad hour and the climax came when de sully refused to pass the extravagant charges for the baptism of the marquis's second son alexandre gabrielle was indignant and appealed angrily and tearfully to the king who supported his minister i have loved you he said at last roused to wrath 
because i thought you gentle and sweet and yielding now that i have raised you to high position i find you exacting and domineering know this i could better spare a dozen mistresses like you than one minister so devoted to me as Sudi. at these harsh words gabrielle burst into tears if i had a dagger she exclaimed i would plunge it into my heart and then you would find your image there and when henri rushed from the room she ran after him flung herself at his feet and with heart-breaking sobs begged for forgiveness and a kind word such troubles as these however were but as the clouds that come and go in a summer sky gabrielle's son was now nearing its zenith henri had long intended to make her his wife at the altar proceedings for divorce from his wife marguerite du valois were running smoothly and now the crowning day in the two lives thus romantically linked was at hand in the months of april fifteen ninety nine gabrielle and henri were spending the last antenuptial days together at fontainebleau the wedding was fixed for the first sunday after easter and gabrielle was ideally happy among her wedding finery and the costly presents that had been showered on her from all parts of france from the ring henri had worn at his coronation and which he was to place on her finger at the altar to a statue of the king in gold from lyons and a giant piece of amber in a silver casket from bordeaux her wedding dress was a gorgeous robe of spanish velvet rich in embroideries of gold and silver the suite of rooms which was to be hers as queen was already ready with its splendors of crimson and gold furnishing the greatest ladies in france were now proud to act as her tier women and princes and ambassadors flocked to fontainebleau to pay her homage the last days of holy week it had been arranged that she should spend in devotion at paris and henri was her escort the greater part of the way when they parted on the banks of the seine they wept in each other's arms while gabrielle full of nameless forebodings clung to her lover and begged him to take her back to fontainebleau but with a final embrace he tore himself away and with streaming eyes gabrielle continued her journey full of fears as to its issue for had not a seer of piedmont told her that the marriage would never take place and other diviners whom she had consulted warned her that she would die young and never call henri husband two days later gabrielle heard mass at the church of saint germain luzeois and on returning to the deanery her aunt's home became seriously ill she grew rapidly worse her sufferings were terrible to witness and on good friday she was delivered of a dead child to quote an eyewitness she lingered until six o'clock in very great pain the like of which doctors and surgeons had never seen before in her agony she tore her face and injured herself in other parts of her body before dawn broke on the following day she drew her last breath when news of her illness reached the king he flew to her swift as his horse could carry him only to meet couriers on his way who told him that madame was already dead and to find when at last he reached saint germain luzeois the door of the room in which she lay barred against him he could not take her living once more into his arms he was not allowed to see her dead henri was as a man who is mad with grief he was inconsolable none dared even to approach him with words of pity and comfort for eight days he shut himself in a black draped room himself clothed in black and he wrote to his sister the root of my love is dead there will be no spring for me any more three months later he was making love to gabrielle's successor henriette d'entrague thus perished in tragedy gabrielle d'estre the creature of sunshine who won the bravest heart in europe and carried her conquest to the very foot of the throne End of chapter 4. Recording by Cassie Christian. Chapter 5 of Love Affairs of the Courts of Europe. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Cassie Christian. Love Affairs of the Courts of Europe by Thornton Hall. Chapter 5 A Queen of Hearts if ever woman was born for love and for empire over the hearts of men it was surely jeanne becou who first opened her eyes one august day in the year seventeen forty three at dreary vocalaire in joan of arc's country and who was fated to dance her light-hearted way through palace of a king to the guillotine scarcely ever has woman born to such beauty and witchery been cradled less auspiciously her reputed father was a scullion her mother a seamstress for grandfather she had fabien becou who left his frying pans in a paris kitchen to lead jeanne Eusen, a fellow-servant to the altar such was the ignoble strain that flowed in the veins of the vocalaire beauty 
who five and twenty years later was playfully pulling the nose of the fifteenth louis and queening it in his palaces with a splendor which marie antoinette herself never surpassed from her sordid home jeanne was transported at the age of six to a convent where she spent nine years in rebellion against rules and punishments until the golden head emerged at last from black woolen veil and coarse unstarched bands the exquisite form from shapeless hideous robe the perfect little feet from abominable yellow shoes to play the first role of ladies maids to a wealthy widow and when she wearied as she quickly did quaffing hair to learn the arts of millinery picture says du Roncourt, the glittering shop where all day long charming idlers and handsome great gentlemen lounged and ogled the pretty milliner tripping through the streets her head covered by a big black calèche whence her golden curls escaped her round dainty waist defined by a muslin frilled pinafore her feet in little high-heeled buckled shoes and in her hand a tiny fan which she uses as she goes and then imagine the conversations proposals replies such was jeanne becou in the first bloom of her dainty beauty the prettiest gudette who ever set hearts fluttering in paris streets with laughter dancing in her eyes a charming pertness at her red lips grace in every movement and the springtide of youth racing through her veins when voltaire first saw her portrait he exclaimed the original was fashioned for the gods and we cannot wonder as we look on the ravishing beauty of the face that wrung this eloquent tribute from the cold-blooded cynic the tender melting violet of the eyes with their sweeping brown lashes under the exquisite arch of brown eyebrows the dainty little greek nose the bent bow of the tiny delicious mouth the perfect oval of the face the complexion fair and fresh as an infant's and a glorious halo of golden hair a dream of fascinating curls and tendrils it was to this bewitching picture with the perfume and light as of a goddess of love that jean du Barry, self-styled pont adventurer and roué succumbed at a glance but du Barry's tenure of her heart if indeed he ever touched it at all was brief for the moment louis the fifteenth set eyes on the ravishing girl he determined to make the prize his own a superior claim to which the comte perforce yielded gracefully thus in seventeen sixty eight we find jean becu or mademoiselle roubanier as she now called herself transported by a bound to the palace of versailles and to the first place in the favour of the king having first gone through the farce of a wedding ceremony with du Barry's brother Gion, a husband whom she first saw on the marriage morning and on whom she looked her last at the church door then followed for the maid of the kitchen a few years of such queendom and splendour as have seldom fallen to the lot of any lady cradled in a palace the idolatrous worship of a king the intoxication of the power that only beauty thus enshrined can wield the glitter of priceless jewels rarest laces and richest satins and silks the flash of gold on dinner and toilet table an army of servants in sumptuous liveries the fawning of great court ladies the courtly flatteries of princes every folly and extravagance that money could purchase or vanity desire six years of such intoxicating life and then the end louis is lying on his deathbed and with fear in his eyes and a tardy penitence on his lips is saying to her madame it is time that we should part and indeed the hour of parting had arrived for a few days later he drew his last wicked breath and madame du Barry was under orders to retire to a convent but her grief for the dead king was as brief as her love for him had been small for within a few months we find her installed in her beautiful country home lucienne ready for fresh conquests and eager to drain the cup of pleasure to the last drop nor was there any lack of ministers to the vanity of the woman who had reached the zenith of her incomparable charms among the many lovers who flocked to the country shrine of the widowed queen was louis duc de cosset son of the marechal de brissac who although madame du Barry's senior by nine years was still in the prime of his manhood handsome as an apollo and a model of the courtly graces which distinguished the old noblesse in the day of its greatest pride which was then so near its tragic downfall the Cosset had long been a mute worshipper of louis's beautiful queen and now that she was a free woman he was at last able to pay open homage to her a homage which she accepted with indifference for at the time her heart had strayed to henry seymour 
although in vain the woman whose beauty had conquered all other men was powerless to raise a flame in the breast of the cold-blooded englishman and realizing this she at last bade him farewell in a letter pathetic in its tender dignity it is idle she wrote to speak of my affection for you you know it but what you do not know is my pain you have not deigned to reassure me about that which most matters to my heart and so i must believe that my ease of mind my happiness are of little importance to you i am sorry that i should have to allude to them it is for the last time it was in this hour of dissolution and humiliation that she turned for solace to de Cossé, whose touching constancy at last found its reward it was not long before friendship ripened into a love as ardent as his own and for the first time this fickle beauty whose heart had been a pawn in the game of ambition knew what a beautiful and ennobling thing true love is those were halcyon days which followed for du Cosset and the lady at his loyalty had won days of sweet meetings and tender partings of a union of souls which even death was powerless to dissolve when they could not meet and du Cosset's duties often kept him from her side letters were always on the wing between lucien and paris letters some of which have survived to bring their fragrance to our day thus the lover writes a thousand thanks a thousand thanks dear heart to-day i shall be with you yes i find my happiness is in being loved by you i kiss you a thousand times good-bye i love you for ever in another letter we read yes dear heart i desire so ardently to be with you not in spirit my thoughts are ever with you but bodily that nothing can calm my impatience good-bye my darling i kiss you many and many times with all my heart the curious may read at the french record office many of these letters written in a bold flowing hand by du Cosset in the heyday of his love the paper is time-stained the ink is faded but each sentence still palpitates with the passion that inspired it a century and a quarter ago and with this great love came new honors for du Cosset. his father's death made him duc de brissac head of one of the greatest houses in france owner of vast estates he was appointed governor of paris and colonel of the king's own bodyguard he had in fact risen to a perilous eminence for the clouds of the great revolution were already massing in the sky and the sans crowds were straining to be at the throats of the cursed aristos and to hurl louis from his throne brissac as we must now call him was thus an object of special hatred as of splendor standing out so prominently as representative of the hated noblesse other nobles fearful of the breaking of the storm were flying in droves to seek safety in england and elsewhere but when the governor of paris was urged to fly he answered proudly certainly not i shall act according to my duty to my ancestors and myself and heedless of his life he clung to his duty and his honor presenting a smiling face to the scowls of hatred and envy and spending blissful hours at lucien with the woman he loved nor was she any less conscious of her danger or less indifferent to it she also had become a target of hatred and scarcely veiled threats watchful eyes marked every coming and going of brissac's messengers with their misses of love it was discovered that brissac's aide-de-camp whose life they sought was in hiding in her house that she was supplying the noble immigrants with money the climax was reached when she boldly advertised a reward of two thousand louis for a clue to the jewelry of which burglars had robbed her jewels of which she published a long and dazzling list thus bringing to memory the days when the late king had squandered his ill-gotten gold on her the duke at last alarmed for her never for himself begged her either to escape or as he wrote to come quickly my darling and take every precaution for your valuables if you have any left yes come and your beauty your kindness and magnanimity i am ashamed of it but i feel weaker than you how should i feel otherwise for the one i love best but already the hour for flight had passed the passions of the mob were breaking down the barriers that were now too weak to hold them in check the paris streets had their first baptism of blood prelude to the deluge to follow hideous fierce-eyed crowds were clamoring at the gates of versailles and de brissac was soon on his way a prisoner to orleans the blow had fallen at last suddenly and with crushing force when louis hercule timoleon de cosset brissac soldier from his birth was charged before the national high court with admitting royalists into the guards he answered i have admitted into the king's guard no one but citizens who fulfilled all the conditions contained in the decree of formation and no other answer or plea would he deign to his accusers 
from his orleans prison where he now awaited the inevitable end he wrote daily to his beloved lady and every day brought him a tender and cheering letter from her on the eleventh of august seventeen ninety two he writes i received this morning the best letter i have had for a long time past none have rejoiced my heart so much thank you for it i kiss you a thousand times you indeed will have my last thought ah my darling why am i not with you in a wilderness rather than in orleans a few days later news reached madame du barry that her lover with other prisoners was to be brought from orleans to paris he would thus actually pass her own door she would at least see him once again under however tragic conditions with what leaden steps the intervening hours crawled by each sound set her heart beating furiously as if it would choke her each moment was an agony of anticipation at last she hears the sound of coming feet she flies to the window piercing the dark night with straining eyes the sound grows nearer a tumult of trampling feet and hoarse cries a mob of dark figures surges through her gates pours riotously up the steps and through the open door in the hall there is a pandemonium of cries and oaths the door of her room is burst open and something is flung at her feet she glances down and with a gasp of unspeakable horror looks down on the severed head of her lover red with his blood the sans culotte had indeed taken a terrible revenge they had fallen in overwhelming numbers on the prisoners and their escort the soldiers had fled and de brissac found himself the centre of a mob the helpless target of a hundred murderous blows with a knife for sole weapon he fought valiantly like the brave soldier he was until a cowardly blow from behind felled him to the ground fire at me with your pistols he shouted your work will the sooner be over a few moments later he drew his last gallant breath almost within sight of the house that sheltered his beloved united in life the lovers were not long to be divided since that awful day madame du barry wrote to a friend you can easily imagine what my grief has been they have consummated the frightful crime the cause of my misery and my eternal regrets my grief is complete a life which ought to have been so grand and glorious good god what an end thus cruelly deprived of all that made life worth living she cared little how soon the end came i ask nothing now of life she wrote but that it should quickly give me back to him and her prayer was soon to be granted a few months after that night of horrors she herself was awaiting the guillotine in her cell at the conciergerie in vain did an irish priest who visited her offer to secure her escape if she would give him money to bribe her jailers no she answered with a smile i have no wish to escape i am glad to die but i will give you money willingly on condition that you save the duchesse de montemar and while madame de montemar daughter of the man she loved was making her way to safety under the priest's escort jean dubarry was being led to the scaffold breathing the name of the man she had loved so well and however feeble the flesh glad to follow where he had led the way end of chapter five recording by cassie christian chapter six of love affairs of the courts of europe this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by colleen mcmahon love affairs of the courts of europe by thornton hall chapter six the regent's daughter many unwomanly women have played their parts in the drama of royal courts but scarcely one, not even those Mezzalinas, Catherine II of Russia, and Christina of Sweden, conducted herself with such a shameless disregard of conventionality as Marie-Louise Elizabeth d'Orléans, known to fame as the Duchesse de Berry, who probably crowded within the brief space of her years more wickedness than any woman who was ever cradled in a palace. It is said that this libertine de Duchesse was mad, and certainly he would be a bold champion who would try to prove her sanity. But, apart from any question of a disordered brain, there was a taint in her blood sufficient to account for almost any lapse from conventional standards of pure living. Her father was that Duc d'Orléans who shocked the none too straight-laced Europe of two centuries ago by his orgies. Her grandfather was that other Orléans Duke, brother of Louis the Fourteenth whose passion for his minions broke the heart of his English wife, the Stuart Princess Henrietta, 
and she had for mother one of the daughters of Madame de Montespan, light a love to Le Roi Solier. The offspring of such parents could scarcely have been normal, and how far from normal Marie Louise was, this story of her singular life will show. When her father, the Duc de Chartres, took to wife Mademoiselle de Bois, Montespan's daughter, there were many who significantly shrugged their shoulders and curled their lips at such a union, and one, at least, the Duke's mother, Elizabeth Charlotte, Princess Palatine, was undisguisedly furious. She refused point-blank to be present at the nuptials, and when her son, fresh from the altar, approached her to ask her blessing, she retorted by giving the bridegroom a resounding slap on the face. Such was the ill-omened opening to a wedded life which brought nothing but unhappiness with it, and which gave to the world some of the most degenerate women, in addition to a son who was almost an idiot, who have ever been cradled. The first of these degenerates was Marie Elizabeth, who was born one August day in the year 1695, and who from her earliest infancy was her father's pet and favorite. His idolatry of his firstborn child, indeed, is one of the most inscrutable things in a life full of the abnormal, and in later years afforded much material for the tongue of scandal. He was inseparable from her. Her lightest wish was law to him. He nursed her through her childish illnesses with more than the devotion of a mother, and as she grew to girlhood, he worshipped at the shrine of her young beauty with the adoration of a lover, and put her charms on canvas in the guise of a pagan goddess. The duke's affection for his daughter, indeed, was so extravagant that it was made the subject of scores of scurrilous lampoons, to which even Voltaire contributed, and was a delicious morsel of ill-natured gossip in all the salons and cabarets of Paris. At fifteen, the princess was already a woman, tall, handsome, well-formed, with brilliant eyes and the full lips eloquent of a sensuous nature. Already she had had her initiation into the vices that proved her undoing, for in a court noted for its free living, she was known for her love of the table and the wine bottle. Such was the duke's eldest daughter when she was ripe for the altar, and became the object of an intrigue in which her scheming father, the royal duchesses, the Duc de Saint-Simon, the king himself, and the Jesuits all took a part, and the prize of which was the hand of the young Duc de Berry, a younger son of the Dauphin, the grandson of King Louis. Over the plotting and counterplotting, the rivalries and jealousies which followed, we must pass. It must suffice to record that the king's consent was at last won by the Orléans faction. Madame de Maintenon was persuaded to smile on the alliance, and one July day the nuptials of the Duc de Berry and the Orléans princess were celebrated in the presence of the royal family and the court. A regal supper followed, and the last toast drunk, the young couple were escorted to their room with all of the stately, if scarcely decent, ceremonial, which in those days inaugurated the life of the newly wedded. Seldom has there been a more singular union than this of the Duc d'Orléans' prodigal daughter with the almost imbecile grandson of the French king. The Duc de Berry, it is true, was good to look upon. Tall, fair-haired, with a good complexion and splendid health, he was physically, at age twenty-four, no unworthy descendant of the great Louis. He had, too, many amiable qualities calculated to win affection, but he was mentally little better than a clown. His education had been shamefully neglected, he had been suppressed and kept in the background until, in spite of his manhood, he had all the shyness, awkwardness, and dullness of a backward child. As he himself confessed to Madame de Saint-Simon, they have done all they could to stifle my intelligence. They did not want me to have any brains. I was the youngest, and yet ventured to argue with my brother. Afraid of the results of my courage, they crushed me. They taught me nothing except to hunt and gamble. They succeeded in making a fool of me one incapable of anything, and who will yet be the laughing stock of everybody. Such was the weak-kneed husband to whom was now allied the most precocious, headstrong young woman in all France, and who, although still short of her sixteenth birthday, was a past mistress of the arts of pleasure, and was now determined to have her full fling at any cost. She had been thoroughly spoiled by her too indulgent father, who was even then the most powerful man in France after the king and she was in no mood to brook restraint from anyone, even from Louis himself. 
The pleasures of the table seem now to have absorbed the greater part of her life. Read what her grandmother, the Princess Palatine, says of her. Madame de Berry does not eat much at dinner. How, indeed, can she? She never leaves her room before noon, and spends her mornings in eating all kinds of delicacies. At two o'clock she sits down to an elaborate dinner, and does not rise from the table until three. At four she's eating again, fruit, salad, cheese, etc. She takes no exercise, whatever. At ten she has a heavy supper, and retires to bed between one and two in the morning. She likes very strong brandy. And in this last sentence we have the true secret of her undoing. The royal princess was, even at this early age, a confirmed dipsomaniac, with her brandy bottle always by her side, and was seldom sober from rising to retiring. To such a woman, a slave to the senses, a husband like the Duc de Berry, unredeemed by a vestige of manliness, could make no appeal. She wanted men to pay her homage, and like Catherine of Russia, she had them in abundance lovers who were only too ready to pay court to a beautiful princess, who might one day be queen of France. For the Dauphin was now dead. His eldest son, the Duc de Bourgogne, had followed him to the grave a few months later. Prince Philip had renounced his right to the French crown when he accepted that of Spain. And between her husband and the throne there was now but one frail life, that of the three-year-old Duc d'Anjou, a child so delicate that he might easily not survive his great-grandfather Louis, whose hand was already relaxing its grasp of the scepter he had held so long. On the intrigues with which this queen in posse beguiled her days, it is perhaps well not to look too closely. They are unsavory, as so much of her life was. Her lovers succeeded one another with quite bewildering rapidity, and with little regard either to rank or good looks. One special favorite of our sultana was La Haye, a court equerry, whom she made chamberlain, and who is pictured by Saint-Simon as tall, bony, with an awkward carriage and an ugly face, conceited, stupid, dull-witted, and only looking at all passable when on horseback. So infatuated was the Duchesse with her ill-favored equerry that nothing less would please her than an elopement to Holland, a proposal which so scared La Haye that in his alarm he went forthwith to the lady's father and let the cat out of the bag. Why on earth does my daughter want to run away to Holland? The Duke exclaimed with a laugh. I should have thought she was having quite good enough time here. And so would anyone else have thought. And while his Duchesse was thus dallying with her multitude of lovers and stupefying herself with her brandy bottle, her husband was driven to his wit's end by her exhibitions of temper, as by her infidelities. In vain he stormed and threatened to have her shut up in a convent. All her retort was to laugh in his face and order him out of her apartment. Violent scenes were everyday incidents. The last one, says Saint-Simon, was at Rambouillet, and by a regrettable mishap the Duchesse received a kick. The Duke's laggard courage was spurred to fight more than one duel for his wife's tarnished fame. Of one of these sorry combats, Maurepas writes, her conduct with her father became so notorious that his grace, the Duc de Berry, Disgusted at the scandal, forced the Duc d'Orléans to fight a duel on the terrace at Marley. They were, however, soon separated, and the whole affair was hushed up. But release from such an intolerable life was soon coming to the ill-used Duke. One day, when hunting, he was thrown from his horse and ruptured a blood vessel. Fearful of alarming the king, now nearing the end of his long life, he foolishly made light of his accident, and only consented to see a doctor when it was too late. When the doctors were at last summoned, he was a dying man, his body drained of blood, which was later found in bowls concealed in various parts of his bedroom. With his last breath, he said to his confessor, Ah, Reverend Father, I alone am the real cause of my death. Thus, one May day in 1714, the Duchesse found herself a widow, within four years of her wedding day, and the last frail barrier was removed from the path of self-indulgence and low passion to which her life was dedicated. When, with the aged king's death the following year, her father became regent of France, her position as daughter of the virtual sovereign was now more splendid than ever, and before she had worn her widow's weeds a month, she had plunged again still deeper into dissipation, with Madame de Mouchy, one of her waiting women, as chief minister to her pleasures. It was at this time, before her husband had been many weeks in his grave, that the Comte de Riome, the last and most ill-favored of her many lovers, came on the scene. 
nothing but a perverted taste could surely have seen any attraction in such a lover as this grand nephew of the duc de lausanne of whom the austere and disapproving palatine duchess draws the following picture he has neither figure nor good looks he is more like an ogre than a man with his face of greenish yellow he has the nose eyes and mouth of a chinaman he looks in fact more like a baboon than the gascon he really is conceited and stupid his large head seems to sit on his broad shoulders owing to the shortness of his neck he is short-sighted and altogether is preternaturally ugly and he appears so ill that he might be suffering from some loathsome disease to this unflattering description saint simon adds the fact that his large pasty face was so covered by pimples that it looked like one large abscess such then was the repulsive lover who found favor in the eyes of the regent's daughter and for whom she was ready to discard all her legion of more attractive wooers with the coming of derriome the duchesse entered on the last and worst stage of her misspent life strange tales are told of the orgies of which the luxembourg the splendid palace her father had given her was now the scene orgies in which madame de mouchy and a jesuit one father ringlet took a part and over which the evil de riome ruled as lord of merry disports the duchesse now sunk to the lowest depths of degradation was the veriest puppet in his strong hands flattered by his coarse attentions and submitting to rudeness and ridicule such as any grisette with a grain of pride would have resented when these scandalous carryings on at the luxembourg palace reached the regent's ears and he ventured to read his daughter a severe lecture on her conduct she retaliated by snapping her fingers at him and telling him in so many words to mind his own business and to the tongue of scandal that found voice everywhere she turned a contemptuous ear she even locked and barred her palace gates to keep prying eyes at a safe distance but although she thus defied man she was powerless to stay the steps of fate her health robust as it had been was shattered by her excesses and when a serious illness assailed her she was horrified to find death so uncomfortably near in her alarm she called for a priest to shrive her and the abbe Languet came at the summons to bring her the consolations of the church he refused point blank however to give the sinner absolution until the palace was purged of the presence of de Riome and madame de mouchy the arch partners in her vices to this suggestion the duchesse perilous as her condition was returned an uncompromising no if the abbe would not absolve her well there were other priests less exacting who would and one such priest of elastic conscience a franciscan friar was summoned to her bedside then ensued an unseemly struggle around the dying woman's bed in which the regent cardinal noailles madame de mouchy and the rival clerics all played their parts while the obliging friar remained in the room awaiting an opportunity to administer the last sacrament the abbe and his curates kept watch at the bedroom door to see that he did no such thing and thus the siege lasted for four days and nights until the patient's crisis over the services of the church were summarily dispensed with with the return of health the duchesse's piety quickly evaporated it is true that she had had a fright and by way of modified penitence she vowed to dress herself and her household in white for six months and also to make a husband of her lover Within a few weeks, de Riome led the regent's daughter to the altar, thus throwing the cloak of the church over the license of the past. Now that our princess was once more a respectable woman, she returned gladly to her old life of indulgence, until the Duchess Palatine exclaimed in alarm, I am afraid her excesses in drinking and eating will kill her. And never was prediction more sure of early fulfillment. When she was not keeping company with her brandy bottle, she was gorging herself with delicacies of all kinds, from patties and fricassees to peaches and nectarines, washed down with copious draughts of iced beer. As a last desperate effort to reform her, at the eleventh hour, the regent packed de Riome off to his regiment. A few days later, the Duchesse invited her father to a sumptuous banquet on the terrace at Meudon, at which, regardless of her delicate health, she ate and drank more voraciously than ever. The same evening she was taken ill, and when, on the following Sunday, her mother-in-law, the Duchess, visited her, she found the patient in a deplorable condition, wasted to a shadow and burning with fever. She was suffering such horrible pains in her toes and under her feet, says the Duchess, that tears came to her eyes. She looked so very bad that three doctors were called in consultation. 
They resolved to bleed her, but it was difficult to bring her to it, for her pains were so great that the least touch of the sheets made her shriek. A few days later, in the early hours of 17th July, 1719, the Duchesse de Berry passed away in her sleep. The life which she had wasted in such shameless prodigality closed in peace, and at the moment when she was being laid to rest in the church of Saint-Denis, Madame de Mouchy, blazing in the dead woman's jewels, was laughing merrily over her champagne glass at a dinner party to which she had invited all the sharers in the orgies which had made the palace of the Luxembourg infamous. The moral of this pitifully squandered life needs no pointing out, and on reviewing it one can only in charity echo the words spoken by Madame de Melluret of another sinner, the Chevalier de Savoie. For my part, I believe the good God must think twice before sending one born of such parents to the nether regions. End of chapter 6. Recording by Colleen McMahon. Chapter 7 of Love Affairs of the Courts of Europe. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Colleen McMahon. Love Affairs of the Courts of Europe by Thornton Hall. Chapter 7 A Princess of Mystery. In the spring of the year 1772, the fashionable world of Paris was full of speculation and gossip about a stranger, as mysterious as she was beautiful, who had appeared from no one knew where in its midst, and who called herself the Princess Ali Emete de Vlodimir. That she was a woman of rank and distinction admitted of no question. Her queenly carriage and the graciousness and dignity of her deportment were in keeping with the royal character she assumed. But more remarkable than these evidences of high station was her beauty, which in its brilliance eclipsed that of the fairest women of Versailles and the Tuileries. Tall, with a figure of exquisite modeling and grace, her daintily poised head crowned with a coronal of golden-brown hair, with a face of perfect oval, dimpled cheeks as delicately tinted as a rose, her chief glory lay in her eyes, large and lustrous, which had the singular quality of changing color now blue, now black, which gave to their dreamy expression a peculiar, mysterious air. Who was she, this woman of beauty and mystery? It was rumored that she was a Circassian princess, the heroine of strange romances. She was living luxuriously in a fine house in the most fashionable quarter of Paris, in company with two German barons, one, the Baron von Ems, who claimed to be her cousin, the other, Baron von Schenk, who appeared to play the role of guardian. To her salon in the Ile Saint-Louis were flocking many of the greatest men in France, infatuated by her beauty, and paying homage to her charms. To a man they adored the mysterious lady, from Prince Oinsky and other illustrious refugees from Poland, to the Comte de rochefort velcourt the Duke of Limburg's representative at the French court, and the wealthy old beau, Monsieur de Marin, who, it was said, placed his long purse at her disposal. But while the men were thus her slaves, the women tossed their heads contemptuously at their dangerous rival. She was an adventuress, they declared with one voice, and great was their satisfaction when one day news came that the Baron von Ems had been arrested for debt, and that on investigation he proved to be no baron at all, but the good-for-nothing son of a Ghent tradesman. The bubble had soon burst, and the attentions of the police became so embarrassing that the princess was glad to escape from the scene of her brief triumphs with her cavaliers, von M's liberty having been purchased by that credulous old fool de Moran, to Frankfurt, leaving a wake of debts behind. Arrived at Frankfurt, the fair Circassian resumed her luxurious mode of life, carrying a part of her retinue of admirers with her and making it known that she was daily expecting a large remittance from her good friend the Shah of Persia. And it was not long before, thanks to the offices of de rochefort Velcourt, she had at her feet no less a personage than Philip, Duke of Limburg, and Prince of the Empire, one of those petty German potentates who assumed more than the airs and arrogance of kings. Though his duchy was no larger than an English county, Philip had his ambassadors at the courts of Vienna and Versailles, and though he had neither courtiers, army, nor exchequer, he lavished his titles of nobility, 
and surrounded himself with as much state and ceremonial as any czar or emperor. But exalted and serene as was his highness, he was caught as helplessly in the toils of the Princess Ali as any lovesick boy, and within a week of making his first bow, had her installed in his castle at Oberstein, after satisfying the most clamorous of her creditors with borrowed money. That there might be no question of obligation, the princess repaid him with the most lavish promises to redeem his heavily mortgaged estate with the millions she was daily expecting from Persia, and to use her great influence with Tsar and Sultan to support his claim to the Schleswig and Holstein duchies, and that he might be in no doubt as to her ability to discharge these promises, she showed him letters addressed to her in the friendliest of terms by these august personages. Each day, in the presence of this most alluring of princesses, forged new fetters for the susceptible duke, until one day she announced to him, with tears streaming down her pretty cheeks, that she had received a letter recalling her to Persia to be married. The crucial hour had arrived. The duke, reduced to despair, begs her to accept his own exalted hand in marriage, vowing that if she refuses, he will shut himself up in a cloister, and is only restored to a measure of sanity when she promises to consider his offer. When Hornstein, the duke's ambassador to Vienna, appears on the scene, full of suspicion and doubts, she makes an equally easy conquest of him. She announces to his gratified ears her wish to become a Catholic, flatters him by begging him to act as her instructor in the creed that is so dear to him, and she reveals to him, for the first time, the true secret of her identity. She is really, she says, the Princess of Azov, heiress to vast estates, which may come to her any day, and the first use she intends to make of her millions is to fill the empty coffers of the Limburg duchy. Hornstein is not only converted, he becomes as ardent an admirer as his master the Duke. The Princess takes her place as the coming Duchess of Limburg, much to the disgust of his subjects, who share their feelings by hissing when she appears in public. Her hour of triumph has arrived when, like a bolt from the blue, an anonymous letter comes to Hornstein, revealing the story of her past doings in several capitals of Europe, and branding her as an impostor. For a time, the Duke treats these anonymous slanders with scorn. He refuses to believe a word against his divinity, the beautiful, high-born woman who is to crown his life's happiness and, incidentally, to save him from bankruptcy. But gradually the poison begins to work, supplemented as it is by the suspicions and discontent of his subjects. At last he summons up courage to ask an explanation, to beg her to assure him that the charges against her are as false as he believes them. She listens to him with quiet dignity until he is finished, and then replies, with tears in her eyes, that she is not unprepared for disloyalty from a man who is so obviously the slave of false friends and public opinion, but that she had hoped that he would at least have some pity and consideration for a woman who was about to become the mother of his child. This unexpected announcement, with its appeal to his manhood, proves more eloquent than a world of proofs and protestations. The Duke's suspicions vanish in the face of the news that the woman he loves is to become the mother of his child, and in a moment he is at her knees, imploring her pardon and uttering abject apologies. He is now more deeply than ever in her toils, ready to defy the world in deference of the princess he adores and can no longer doubt. It is at this stage that a man who is to play such an important part in the princess's life first crosses her path, Juan Domanski, a handsome young Pole, whose passionate and ill-fated patriotism had driven him from his native land to find an asylum, like many another Polish refugee, in the Limburg duchy. He had heard much of the romantic story of the Princess Ali, and was drawn by sympathy, as by the rumor of her remarkable beauty, to seek an interview with her during her visit to Mannheim. Such a meeting could have but one issue for the romantic Pole. He lost both head and heart at the sight of the lovely and gracious princess, and from that moment became the most devoted of all her slaves. When she returned to Oberstein, he was swift to follow her and to install himself under her castle walls, where he could catch an occasional glimpse of her, or, by good fortune, have a few blissful moments in her company. 
Indeed, it was not long before stories began to be circulated among the good folk of Oberstein, of strange meetings between the mysterious young stranger who had come to live in their midst and an equally mysterious lady. The postman, it was rumored, often sees him on the road leading to the castle, talking in a shadow with someone enveloped in a long black hooded cloak whom he once thought he recognized as the princess. No wonder tongues wagged in Oberstein. What could be the meaning of these secret assignations between the princess, who was the destined bride of their duke, and the obscure young refugee? It was a delicious bit of scandal to add to the many which had already gathered round the adventuress. But there was a greater surprise in store for the Obersteiners, as for the world outside their walls. Soon it began to be rumored that the duke's bride-to-be was no obscure Circassian princess, this was merely a convenient cloak to conceal her true identity, which was none less than that of daughter of an empress. She was, in fact, the child of Elizabeth, Tsarina of Russia, and her peasant husband, Razum, and in proof of her exalted birth, she actually had in her possession the will in which the late empress bequeathed to her the throne of Russia. How these rumors originated, no one seemed to know. Was it Domansky who set them circulating? We know at least that they soon became public property, and that, strangely enough, they won credence everywhere. The very people who had branded her an adventuress and hissed her in the streets now raised cheers to the future Empress of Russia, while the Duke, delighted at such a wonderful transformation in the woman he loved, was more eager than ever to hasten the day when he could call her his own. As for the Princess, she accepted her new dignities with the complacence to be expected from a daughter of a Tsarina. There was now no need to refer the skeptics to Circassia for proof of her station and her potential wealth. As heiress to one of the greatest thrones of Europe, she could at last reveal herself in her true character without any need for dissimulation. The curtain was now ready to rise on the crowning act of her life drama, an act more brilliant than any she had dared to imagine. Russia was seething with discontent and rebellion. The throne of Catherine II was trembling. One revolt had followed another, until Pugachev had led his rabble of a hundred thousand serfs to the very gates of Moscow, only when success seemed assured to meet disaster and death. If the ex-bandit could come so near to victory, an uprising headed by Elizabeth's own daughter and heiress could scarcely fail to hurl Catherine from her throne. It would have been difficult to find a more powerful ally in this daring project than Prince Charles Radziwill, chief of Polish patriots, who was then, as luck would have it, living in exile at Mannheim, and who hated Russia as only a Pole ever hated her. To Radziwill then, Domanski went to offer the help of his princess for the liberation of Poland and the capture of Catherine's throne. Here, indeed, was a valuable pawn to play in Radziwill's game of vengeance and ambition but the prince was by no means disposed to snatch the bait hurriedly. Experience had taught him caution. He must count the cost carefully before taking the step, and while writing to the princess, I consider it a miracle of providence that it has provided so great a heroine for my unhappy country. He took his departure to Venice, suggesting that the princess should meet him there, where matters could be more safely and successfully discussed. Thus it was that the princess said her last goodbye to her ducal lover, full of promises for the future when she should have won her throne, and as Countess of Pinneberg, set forth with a retinue of followers to Venice, where she was regally received at the French embassy. Here she tasted the first sweets of her coming queendom, holding her courts, to which distinguished Poles and Frenchmen flocked to pay homage to the Empress-to-be, and having daily conferences with Radziwill, who treated her as already a queen. That her purse was empty and the bankers declined to honor her drafts was a matter to smile at, since the way now seemed clear to a crown, with all it meant of wealth and power. When the Venetian government grew uneasy at the plotting within its borders, she went to Ragusa, where she blossomed into the princess of all the rushes, assumed the scepter that was soon to be hers, issued proclamations as a sovereign, and crowned these regal acts by sending a ukase to Alexis Orloff, the Russian commander-in-chief, signed Elizabeth II, and instructing him to communicate its contents to the army and fleet under his command. 
Once more, however, fortune played the princess a scurvy trick, just when her favor seemed most assured. One night a man was seen scaling the garden wall of the palace she was occupying. The guard fired at him, and the following morning Domanski was found, lying wounded and unconscious in the garden. The tongues of scandal were set wagging again, old suspicions were revived, and once again the word adventurous and worse passed from mouth to mouth. The men who had fawned on her now avoided her. Worse still, Radziwill, his latent suspicions thoroughly awakened and confirmed by a hundred stories and rumors that came to his ears, declined to have anything more to do with her and returned in disgust to Germany. But even this crushing rebuff was powerless to damp the spirits and ambition of the adventurous who shook the dust of Ragusa off her dainty feet and went off to Rome, where she soon cast her spell over Sir William Hamilton, our ambassador there, who gave her the warmest hospitality. For several days, we learn, she reigns like a queen in the salon of the ambassador, out of whose penchant for beautiful women she has no difficulty in willing a passport that enables her to enter the most exclusive circles of Roman society. In Rome, she lays aside her regal trappings, and wins the respect of all by her unostentatious living and prodigal charities. She becomes a favorite at the Vatican. Cardinals do homage to her goodness, with perhaps a pardonable eye to her beauty. But behind the brave and pious front she thus shows to the world, her heart is growing more heavy, day by day. Poverty is at her door in the guise of importunate creditors. Her servants are clamoring for overdue wages, and consumption which for long has threatened her, now shows its presence in hectic cheeks and a hacking cough. Fortune seems at last to have abandoned her, and it requires all her courage to sustain her in this hour of darkness. In her extremity she appeals to Sir William Hamilton for a loan, much as a queen might confer a favor on a subject, and Hamilton, pleased to be a service to so fair and pious a lady, sends her letter to his leghorn banker, Mr. John Dick, with instructions to arrange the matter. While the Princess Ali was practicing piety and cultivating cardinals in Rome, with an empty purse and a pain-racked body to make a mockery of her claim to a crown, away in distant Russia, Catherine II was nursing a terrible revenge on the woman who had dared to usurp her position and threaten her throne. The succession of revolutions, at which she had at first smiled scornfully, had now roused the tigress in her. She would show the world that she was no woman to be trifled with, and the first victim of her vengeance should be that brazen princess who had dared to masquerade as Elizabeth II. She sent imperative orders to her trusted and beloved Orloff, fresh from his crushing defeat of the Turkish fleet, to seize her at any cost, even if he had to raise Ragusa to the ground, and these orders she knew would be executed to the letter. For was not Orloff the man whose strong hands had strangled her husband and placed the crown on her head, also her most devoted slave? He was, it is true, the biggest scoundrel, as he was also one of the handsomest men in Europe, a man ready to stoop to any infamy, and thus the best possible tool for such an infamous purpose. But he was also her greatest admirer, eager to step into the place of chief favorite from which his brother Gregory had just been dismissed. When, however, Orloff went to Ragusa, with his soldiers at his back, he found that the princess had already flown, leaving no trace behind her. He ransacked Sicily in vain, and it was only when Sir William Hamilton's letter to his leghorn banker came to his hands that he discovered that she was in Rome, a much safer asylum than Ragusa. It was hopeless now to capture her by force. He must try diplomacy, and by the hands of an aide-de-camp, he sent her a letter in which he informed her that he had received her ukase and was anxious to pay due homage to the future Empress of Russia. Such was the Judas message Kristineff, Orloff's emissary, carried to the princess, whom he found in a pitiful condition, wasted to a shadow by disease and starvation, in a room cold and bare, whose only furniture was a leather sofa, on which she lay in a high fever, coughing convulsively. To such pathetic straits was Elizabeth II reduced when Kristineff came with his fawning airs and lying tongue 
to tell her that Alexis Orloff, the greatest man in Russia, had instructed him to offer her the throne of the Tsars, and, as an earnest of his loyalty, to beg her acceptance of a loan of 11,000 ducats. In vain did Domanski, who was still by her side, warn her against the smooth-tongued envoy. She was flattered by such unexpected homage. Her eyes were dazzled by the near prospect of the coveted crown, which was to be hers at last, just when hope seemed dead. She would accept Orloff's invitation to go to Pisa to meet him. As for you, she said, if you are afraid, you can stay behind. I am going where destiny calls me. This revolution in her fortunes acted like magic. New life coursed through her veins, color returned to her cheeks, and brightness to her eyes, as one February day in 1775 she left Rome, with the devoted Domanski for companion and a brilliant escort, for Pisa, where Orloff greeted her as an empress. He gave regal fetes in her honor, and filled her ears with honeyed and flattering words. Affecting to be dazzled by her beauty, he even dared to make passionate love to her, which no man of his day could do more effectively than this handsomest of the Orloffs, and so infatuated was the poor princess by the adoration of her handsome lover and the assurance of the throne he was to give her, that she at last consented to share that throne with him, and by his side went through a marriage ceremony, at which two of his officers masqueraded as officiating priests. Nothing remained now between her and the goal of her desires, except to make the journey to Russia as speedily as possible, and a few hours after the wedding banquet, we see her in the Admiral's launch, with Orloff and Domanski and a brilliant suite of officers, leaving Leghorn for the Russian flagship, where she was received with the blare of bands and the booming of artillery. The crowning moment arrived when, as she was being hoisted to the deck in a gorgeous chair suspended from the yardarm, her future sailors greeted her with thunders of shouts, Long live the Empress! The moment she set foot on deck, she was seized. Handcuffs were snapped on her wrists, and she was carried a helpless captive to a cabin. At the same moment, Domanski was overpowered before he had time to use his sword and made a prisoner. The princess's cries for Orloff, her husband and savior, are met with derision. Orloff, she is told, is himself a prisoner. He has in fact vanished, his dastardly mission executed, and she never saw him again. Two months later, the victim of a man's treachery and a woman's vengeance is looking with tear-dimmed eyes on her capital through a barred window of a cell in the fortress of St. Peter and Paul. Over the tragic closing of her days, we may not dwell long. The scene is too pitiful, too harrowing. In vain she implores an interview with Catherine, who blazes into anger at the request. The impudence of the wretch, she exclaims, is beyond all bounds. She must be mad. Tell her, if she wishes any improvement in her lot, to cease the comedy she is playing. Prince Galitsin, Grand Chancellor, exerts all his skill in vain to force a confession of imposture from her. To his wiles and threats alike, she opposes a dignified and calm front. She persists in the story of her birth, refuses to admit that she is an impostor. Even when she is flung into a loathsome cell, with bread and water for diet, she does not waver a jot in her demeanor of dignity or in her royal claims. Only when she is charged with being the daughter of a Prague innkeeper does she allow indignation to master her, as she retorts, I have never been in Prague in my life, and if I knew who had thus slandered me, I would scratch his eyes out. Domanski, too, proves equally intractable. Even the promise of marriage to her will not wring from him a word that might discredit his beloved princess. But although the princess keeps such a brave heart under conditions that might well have broken it, her spirit is powerless against the insidious disease that is working such havoc with her body. In her damp, noisome cell, consumption makes rapid headway. Her strength ebbs daily. The end is coming swiftly near. She makes a last dying appeal to Catherine to see her, if but for a few moments, but the appeal falls on deaf ears. When she sends for a priest to minister to her last hours, and by Catherine's orders he makes a final attempt to wrest her secret from her, she moans with her failing breath, Say the prayers for the dead. That is all there is for you to do here. Four days later, death came to her release. Catherine's throne was safe from this danger, at least and she was left to dalliance with her legion of lovers, 
while the woman on whom she had wreaked such terrible vengeance lay deeply buried in the courtyard of her prison, the very soldiers who dug her grave being sworn to secrecy. Thus in mystery her life opened, and in secrecy it closed. End of chapter 7 Recording by Colleen McMahon